Every once in a while, a band or an artist comes along with a song that just takes the world by storm, grabs the world's ear, can't be denied. And then seemingly overnight, they disappear without a trace, never to be heard from again. Why does that happen? That's our topic for today, One Hit Wonders. All right, how's everybody doing? This is the House of Mars, and we are Mars, an independent rock band, and on this channel, we just don't promote our own music. We talk about and discuss and celebrate the music that we all came up with and love. And before we get started, as always, if you could hit that like and subscribe, that is the easiest, simplest way that you could help us or any other independent content creators. All right, and without any further ado, let's hop into today's topic, One Hit Wonders. So one hit wonder, that's an interesting term. It, it has a, a couple of connotations kind of built into it. Part of it is almost like a derisiveness or a dismissiveness. And then another part of it is kind of pity. So on the first part, derisiveness and, and, and dismissiveness, those are hard words to say together. If you love music and you've been lucky enough to grow up in the past 50 or 60 years, we have been absolutely flooded with great music of all genres. It's an embarrassment of riches. And so we're kind of spoiled. We're used to having great music. We're used to having great acts. We're used to, to artists or bands putting out multiple great albums. And so when someone comes along and they have one great song and it's seemingly that's all they've got in them, we do kind of have a dismissive attitude of like, all right, that's all you got. Okay, next. It's kind of a shitty attitude, honestly, but that is part of it. The other half of it is pity, because a lot of times with a one-hit wonder, it's kind of like a young baseball player who spent their entire life practicing, sweating, just slaving over trying to be the best ball player they can be. They, they play it all through middle school, all through high school. They go, maybe go to college, or maybe they get drafted, and when they finally get called up to the big leagues, that's just it, the moment they've been waiting for. And then they flame out after one season and they go and they get demoted back down into the into the minors and you never hear from them again. And there's kind of like a, a, a pity there for that sort of situation to think that you were so close. You were right there at the brass ring for the thing that you wanted. And it's just slips out of your grasp at the last minute. And that's kind of the same attitude that a lot of people have towards these one hit wonders. So why don't why aren't these one hit wonders able to reproduce their success? Let's talk about that. But first, a little history lesson. So. Human beings, we seem to have music encoded in us. We, we seem to have things like melody and rhythm sort of built into us. Every culture across the planet, it's seemingly going back into, going back into antiquity, um, has had some kind of music, even if it's just basic stuff. If you go back and you study human history and our history on this planet, we have been pretty much hanging on by the skin of our teeth for a good part of that time. We've been fighting natural disasters, wild animals. We have not always been at the top of the food chain, fighting all sorts of catastrophes, fighting one another. And yet somehow we manage to keep creating art. And every once in a while, you'll have civilizations arise that give people a little breathing room, whether it's a republic or whether it's an empire, anyone within the borders of that, of that civilization, they manage to be able to take a bit of a breather, a bit of a pause. They're allowed to get away from just surviving day to day, just scrabbling, just trying to survive. And whenever you see a major civilization arise, you know, you look at ancient history, whether it's Greece or Rome, India, China, the Middle East, Central or South America, whenever people have a bit of a breather, when there's a little bit of peace and prosperity to be had, they have what we would call, you have this thing arise at what we would call a middle class. People who, if they have to, even just a modicum, a little bit of freedom, especially economic freedom, where they can amass a little bit of wealth, and then suddenly they get something called leisure time. They don't have to spend their entire day hunting and gathering or spend their entire day slaving away on a farm just to ensure that they live through another season or another year. You get people who are able to relax a little bit. And whenever you see that happen, you see the arts flourish. Look at any of these ancient civilizations, and a lot of what they leave behind is their art. It's sculpture, painting, now, obviously, they weren't able to record music back then, but often you'll find the instruments that they used at that time. You always see that. Whenever human beings have a moment to catch their breath, they start creating great art. So then fast forward a little bit to like 18th century Europe, where you have these nation states that are incredibly affluent and, and centers of commerce, and there's this enormous concentration of wealth. And you have this absolute flourishing of the arts, especially music. 
you have the great composers, Mozart, Bach, and Beethoven, and all of those. And as a musician, you could make a, a working class living as a musician. There were some exceptions. If you were a once in a generation talent, like a, like a Paganini, or excuse me, Paganini, you could, you could command, like, I guess you'd say, uh, a, a premium on, on your performances. But the vast majority of musicians would make a, a, a working class living at being a musician, which is better than, you know, you could ever do a thousand years ago. So it was something. Now, fast forward a little bit more to America in the 20th century, post-war America, just after World War II. If you study American history at that time, America enjoyed one of the most enormous economic booms ever in, 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 in human history. And that economic boom extended out to almost everybody. It was the, the affluence and the wealth created a vast middle class. So the wealth was wide and it was deep. And so, again you had the creation of this middle class that suddenly had leisure time and they had disposable income. And the little wrinkle with America's post-war boom was that you had kids allowed to be kids. Kids allowed to go through this thing that we now call adolescence. Again, if you look through human history, most children were put to work as early as possible. They had to contribute to the survival of the family or the clan or the village or whatever. You know, by the time you're five, you're going out to the barn before dawn to milk the cows. By the time you're eight or nine, you're fully contributing on that farm or you're sent to a factory to bring in more money to help support the family. And then by the time you're 16, you're like fighting in the Civil War or something. So after World War II, when you had this enormous economic boom, you had the baby boom. We had all these boomers born. And as they grew into being teenagers, they were allowed to do things like go to school for 12 years. OK, they got jobs, not because they had to, not because they had to help support their family, but just they wanted some walking around money. All that money was almost entirely disposable income. And they spent it on anything they wanted, which is why you had suddenly all of these teen fads, hula hoops, poodle skirts and music, 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 music. The boomers and later on Gen X loved music. All the genres enjoyed an enormous explosion and not just popularity, but suddenly this enormous influx of money into all these genres, rock and roll was probably the one that benefited the most. So now you have this industry that creates an enormous amount of wealth and it's loved by this large cohort of teenagers. So there's more of it. And also you have this other effect of you have all of these kids who now are free to pursue other things. They don't just have to work. A lot of them, because they love rock music so much, start picking up guitars, start picking up bass guitars, start playing drums, keyboards, whatever. Now you have this enormous pool of musicians, millions and millions of young people playing instruments. But here's the thing. Yes, now you've got this enormous pool of potential musicians, but the talent is not distributed evenly. Some have more talent than others. So for every Eddie Van Halen who picks up guitar and never looks back, you can have some kid who gets a guitar for Christmas and then by the summertime it's in the garage sale because they just couldn't wrap their mind around it. And to further that idea, you'll have musicians in that enormous pool of talent that will be the absolute cream of the crop. And then you'll have some musicians who are average. Just, you know, they can put, they can put a song together and maybe all they got in them is one good song. And when I say one good song, yes, I'm in terms of speaking about the one hit wonder phenomenon, one song that will explode commercially. Because, yeah, you've got artists who are incredibly talented, have the res respect of critics and their peers, but they never really take off commercially because um, the, what they create just isn't in the public's taste in, in, in a large sense. And that's OK. That does happen. But you'll have that. And you also have just an ordinary, average middle class kid who's got one good song in them. And you know what? That's okay, because you can pity them if you want in terms of, wow, they were almost there. Imagine they, they you know, they, they're, they're, they're grinding out and they're trying to, you know, they're working on uh, becoming a better instrumentalist. They finally get a band together. They finally get noticed by a label. They get signed and they go out there and they grind it out and they get that one brief shining moment of where suddenly everything comes together. The stars align and they're famous. They got a hit. And then it just all kind of falls away. They never see it again. They get that one little peak. You know what? That's okay. You know why? Because they did get that one little peak. It's a lot more, it's a hell of a lot more than most of us will ever have. So yeah, you can pity them or you can celebrate the fact that, 
you know, they got to get some, they, they got to see something that most of us never get to see. And also another interesting little detail about one hit wonders is the songs themselves. A lot of times these songs were throwaways. They were considered filler. You know, sometimes these artists would come up with a single and say, oh, this is it. And then, well, you know, back in the old days when you had 45s, well, you got an A side and a B side. And the B side is usually a throwaway song. Sometimes it was the B side that turned out to be the hit. And they were you know, just completely flummoxed by it. Why? Why does that happen? So sometimes the reason why that happened was this. You will be in a situation where you're, you're a band or you're an artist and you're recording your first album or your third album or whatever. And your manager comes to you and says, hey, look, uh, the label says the album's too short. They need another song. OK, it's at, you know, 29 minutes and they need it to be 34 minutes or whatever. So a lot of times you spend all this time and effort, all this work crafting your masterpiece. And then your, your manager says, we need one more song. So you look at everyone and say, OK, whatever, let's just throw something together. And an interesting thing happens. Musicians will fall back on their instincts. Musicians will fall back on those most basic human instincts when it comes to music. You ever seen like a one-year-old baby and you play a song and they start to start bopping to it, you know? And did you know that in, in cultures that, you know, were pre-literate or did not have a, you know, a formal written language, they would often pass down stories through songs. Now you look at something like the Iliad. It was thousands and thousands of years before it was actually formally written down. And before that, it was passed on through oral tradition. And it wasn't spoken, it was chanted. Why? Because it's easier to remember. Things like melody, things like repetition, arrangement, those things are part of our, part of our brains, part of our human makeup. And so that means sometimes, in some cases, music is a very, it's a, it's a very useful tool in our survival. And so we've developed that part of our brain that responds to music, that knows music when we hear it. And what do we respond to the most? Melody, arrangement, and rhythm. I remember, if you've probably seen interviews with Dave Grohl when he talked about his days in, in uh, Nirvana, he would say that Kurt Cobain's writing process, it was like he was writing nursery rhymes because they were just so elegantly simple. They just had what they needed and no more. And what did they have? Great rhythm, great hooks, great melodies, and just really simple, iconic ar arrangements that grabbed you. And so what musicians will do, it's like, when you say, just write a song real quick, well, the ego goes out the window and they're just like, okay, and what do they do? They fall back on, again, I'm sounding like a broken record, but they fall back on melody, arrangement, hooks, uh, repetition. And so that's why a lot of these hits to become sort of pop wonders, that's what they all share in common very often. And that's why you'll have an album and then you'll have that one song on the album that has all of those elements that make it, uh, I guess you'd say, susceptible to mass appeal because they have all of those elements that most human beings will respond to. Another great example is Black Sabbath, okay? Not exactly a singles band, okay? And they are certainly not, you know, they are not one-hit wonders. I mean, they had, what, a 50-year career? And hell, Tony Iommi and, and, and Ozzy were up on a stage somewhere in Europe uh, just, uh, just about a week and a half ago. So still going strong, even at their age. Their one hit, so to speak, was Paranoid. And they had that hit precisely for that reason. Their management came to them and said, the album's too short, the label wants another song. So they just threw something together. And that was Paranoid. And what is Paranoid? It's got a catchy riff. It's got a propulsive, really fun rhythm. It's got a great, simple arrangement that every, anyone can follow along to. And it's got um, a great vocal melody. And so that's Black Sabbath's one hit. So to wrap it all up, yeah, one hit wonders. I suppose we can dismiss them or pity them. But again, I choose to celebrate them for they got a shot at something that most of us will never see. And if they're lucky, that song becomes popular enough to where it goes on a sort of permanent rotation, whether it's on album-oriented radio, adult contemporary, classic rock. That song keeps getting played long after it had its big splash. And if they were lucky and they had good management, which admittedly is a crapshoot, um, they're still drawing royalties for those songs decades after they, they had, again, that initial big smash. So you can have someone like Rupert Holmes, who had a big hit, I remember, it was with late 70s, early 80s. I was in middle school. The Pina Colada song. It's called Escape, but everyone knows it by the Pina Colada song. That song was huge that year. And I can remember in my middle school band, we played it for a recital. I mean, that's how big it was. It's like you, you could not ignore this song. Well, then it went away for a while, but then it entered into rotation later on, on sort of, not classic rock, but sort of, Classic hits, all your oldies from, you know, the 60s, 70s, and 80s kind of kind of format, radio stations. 
It turned up in movies. It was in Guardians of the Galaxy. And so, and to this day, Rupert, unless he had bad management or sold the rights to the song, he's still drawing royalties for that song. It's still helping him pay the bills. Not too shabby. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you again for watching. Like and subscribe to the video, and we'll check you out later.